The following program, The Russ Belleville Show, is intended for responsible adults only. We advocate to the repeal of marijuana prohibition for adults. We discuss the science, culture, and controversy about America's marijuana laws. We do not advocate any illegal activity and encourage all listeners to learn their state and federal marijuana laws. Opinions and claims made by guests and advertisers on the Russ Belleville Show are their own, and the Russ Belleville Show cannot be held legally responsible for their validity or reliability. Viewer discretion is advised. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it, and it goes down smooth. Spanning the continent to bring you the truth about cannabis and marijuana law reform. I smoke pot and I like it a lot. From the promise of legalization. Of prohibition. And one major responsibility is to encourage people to use less drugs. The Rush Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Brought to you by the National Cannabis Coalition. Yeah, I hear you. You had a question for me. I... Now, here's your host, Radical Russ Belleville. Hi, uh, yeah. Good day, tokers and tokets, and welcome. It is Thursday. Already, July 26, 2012, and it's got to be 420 somewhere in the world. Thank you for joining us here at Rolla J Studios in Potland, Oregon, Br- brought to you here by the National Cannabis Coalition. Check it out at ncc420.com. Get involved. You can be a part of the fastest growing 21st century marijuana legalization organization in the world. Please join us. We're going to make a big splash in 2012. We've got all sorts of stuff to get to you today on today's show. We start off by introducing right here in the studio. We got Wiz Coleco hanging out here. How are you doing, Coleco? Doing quite well. Glad to be here. Hello, everybody. So uh, Coleco today uh, brought me the great news of the booking of today's guest. So I will let you tell everybody what a cool guest we got on today's show. Yeah, we're stoked to have Mark Kleiman from uh, UCLA's uh, School of Public Policy. Uh, obviously, he's written a lot of uh, marijuana legalization or authored a lot of marijuana legalization studies with the Rand Corporation. And he's going to be on talking about his latest book, Marijuana Legalization, What Everyone Needs to Know, which he uh, partnered with a few other Rand uh, researchers for. So we're stoked to have him on at 3.30 today. Yeah, and uh, you know we've commented on that book that it's been coming up in Huffington Post and Rolling Stone. I've written a couple of posts uh, debunking a couple of the uh, the points made in it, so it, I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, an intelligent conversation on this issue with someone who uh, is you know, taking a, a public policy look at the uh, marijuana issue and might have some things to say that uh, we might not agree with. So this will be a great discussion. Really looking forward to it. Uh, on today's show, Cannabis Carry's got the day off. In fact, it's just me and Coleco bringing you the show today, so I'm going to take care of our uh, daily cannabis Cannabis Chronicle today, and uh, in the news we've got all sorts of interesting headlines. Uh, the big headline is Operation Log Jam, which took place in 109 cities today or yesterday. Uh, raids uh, coordinated by many federal agencies to combat uh, the so-called synthetic marijuana menace that has cropped up across the nation. We'll talk to you about that. Also, we've got news on the Olympics. An interesting quote from uh, former USA basketball star Grant Hill on uh, on how drug testing affects the USA basketball basketball team's uh, point output. Very interesting uh, quote that he had there. Also, we're going to be taking a a look at the Los Angeles dispensary ban and the latest plans by activists down there to counter that ban and possibly put it up as a referendum before the voters. And in international news, we're going to take a look at Tasmania, Australia, and their recent government inquiries into the possibility and potentiality of an industrial hemp uh, industry there in Tasmania, specifically for the manufacture of special types of plastic. Something very, very interesting to us, those of us that are concerned about our environment. Also on today's show, it's Groovin' Thursday, and uh, I got an email the other day from uh, producer and DJ Daniel DeZuko. Uh, met him in Atlanta, Georgia. He's got a new artist he wanted me to check out named Wes Green. We're going to bring you some hip-hop from him today for your 20 after break. As mentioned, at half past, we've got Dr. Mark Kleiman from UCLA joining us, the public policy professor, to discuss his book on marijuana legalization, Everything You Need to Know. And then at the end of the show, I set my sights on my good non 
non-pot smoking friend, Dr. Kevin Sabet, in his most recent op-ed in the Huffington Post that claims Californians are having buyer's remorse for their uh, passage of medical marijuana. I show you how that is completely wrong. <laughs> All that and more coming up in hour two. Our Toker Talk Radio will take your calls. So stick around. You're listening to the Russ Belville Show. We'll be right back after this. It's simply business. It's simply business. It's simply business. You know why they won't let us grow. It's simply business. We'll be right back after these messages from our 420 friendly sponsors. Support these advertisers because their ad money goes straight to the Russ Belleville Show. You're tuned into the Russ Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Brought to you by the National Cannabis Coalition. It's simply business. It's simply business. It's simply business. You know why they won't let us grow. It's simply business. It's simply business. Support the Russ Belleville Show. Text the word Russ to 420 and connect with the National Cannabis Coalition. You can also send 10 bucks to the Russ Belleville Show right from your smartphone. That's Russ to 420 You're listening to Radical Russ on the Russ Belleville Show. Well, I see little red Darling, your mud's too Neil deGrasse Tyson may grab you off the street at any minute. I know that the molecules in my body are traceable to phenomena in the cosmos. That makes me want to grab people in the street and say, have you heard this? This is Normal Show Live. Marijuana is not going to re-legalize itself. You've got to do your part. Join the National Cannabis Coalition today at nationalcannabiscoalition.com. Medical marijuana, industrial hemp, ganja sacrament, consumer cannabis. The topic of marijuana is heating up the news, and the Russ Belleville Show catches you up with today's latest headlines. Now, here's our senior news editor, Cannabis Carey, with the Daily Cannabis Chronicle. Kerry has the day off today. I'm Russ Belleville with your Daily Cannabis Chronicle. Activists are planning strategy to counter Los Angeles dispensary ban. Following a unanimous vote by the Los Angeles City Council to ban all storefront medical marijuana dispensaries, activists in the community are planning their next actions to counter the ban. The ban, set to go into effect within 40 days, forbids all medical marijuana cultivation and distribution not produced by collectives of three patients or less and their caregivers. Patient advocates complain such a system cannot possibly provide for the hundreds of thousands of patients needing cannabis medicine, especially the most sick and disabled who are least likely to be able to grow their own. Americans for Safe Access spokesman Don Duncan, speaking to NBCNews.com, stated, quote, This is an outrage that the city council would think a reasonable solution to the distribution of medical marijuana would be to simply outlaw it altogether, end quote. His group and allied supporters of medical marijuana will be working to enact a citizen's referendum on the ban, which would require 27,000 signatures of registered voters to put the ban before the voters of Los Angeles. Observers of the medical marijuana industry point out that the ban will have the greatest effect on the best dispensaries that steadfastly follow whatever regulations they are given. Some of them will become delivery services, others will migrate to nearby cities, such as West Hollywood or Long Beach, that don't have bans. Others will defy the ban or return to unregulated black market sales. One thing that won't happen, the hundreds of thousands of medical marijuana patients in Los Angeles won't stop using cannabis. But Los Angeles will certainly stop receiving any sales taxes, payroll taxes, and economic benefit from that cannabis use. 
Well, you know, we've talked a lot about this uh, L.A. dispensary ban, and, you know, they've had so many years now, <laughs> 16 years, 17, yeah, about 16 years now to get something right, to find out some sort of regulation that is going to work. But in the absence of putting together any regulation, these uh, storefront uh, marijuana dispensaries have proliferated. And and I looked through a lot of the uh, the local news stories on this and, and heard about the complaints from some people that talk about some of the, the seedier of these dispensaries, some of these where, you know, there'll be patients gathered out front, you know, uh, smoking cannabis and right there on the streets where people having to walk back and forth between them and so forth. Uh, I, I believe that, that much of this can be overblown, but still, uh, given how many dispensaries there are and the lack of regulations in Los Angeles, there are bound to be the bottom of the barrel dispensaries that are going to make the entire industry look bad for the majority of them that are doing a very, very good job. And you can lay the blame for that at the feet of the Los Angeles City Council. Those kind of things naturally happen in the absence of good, sensible regulation. And the majority of these dispensary owners would follow sensible regulations if they had the chance to follow them. The fact is, the medical marijuana industry in California is not going away. That demand is not going away. So it's time Los Angeles pull its head out of the sand and start to realize that it's their job to come up with regulations everyone can work with. And doing something like just trying to ban a certain number or set an arbitrary limit or, or worse off when they were going to just have a lottery to determine which ones would stay open just go, runs counter to good governments governance a, a lottery really instead of using some sort of investigative technique to find out which of these dispensaries might be the best players in the market you wanted to go with a lottery it just goes to show what happens when you have governance by people who don't believe in the will of the people when you have 14 or 15 people on the council there that that personally don't like medical marijuana and don't want to see it succeed, and they're going to do everything they can to make sure that it doesn't succeed, and when the bad stuff happens, they can say, oh, see, look how awful medical marijuana is. Well, it doesn't seem to be that awful in San Francisco or Oakland or other places that have come up with sensible regulations to deal with this. So Los Angeles, it's time to finally come up with reasonable regulations, or the people are just going to vote a referendum on your ban. It's going to go back to the way it was, and you'll be back to square one. Come on, work with the activists, work with the community, and we can all find something that benefits us far better than the status quo. Big news today, federal raids nationwide against sellers of so-called synthetic marijuana. In coordinated actions across 109 cities nationwide, the federal government is cracking down on the so-called synthetic marijuana craze. The product, sold under brand names such as K2 and Spice, consists of plant materials sprayed with synthetic cannabinoids first created by scientists to mimic the effects of natural cannabis in the lab. The packaging indicates the substances to be herbal incense, and consumers are plainly warned the substances are, quote, not for human consumption, end quote. However, those warnings around the sales of K2 and Spice are as genuine as the signs in the head shop warning the bongs are for tobacco use only. Operation Logjam, as it is known, is a joint operation involving the Drug Enforcement Administration, Immigrations and Customs Enforcement, the Internal Revenue Service, the Border Patrol and Customs Agency, the Federal Bureau of Investigations, and the Food and Drug Administration, as well as several state and local law enforcement entities. The crackdown is in response to increasing reports of severe health consequences from use of these substances. In 2010, about 3,200 calls were received by poison control centers nationwide regarding K2 or Spice. In 2011, that number had escalated to over 13,000 calls, with the majority involving people aged 25 and younger. Law enforcement in Madison, Milwaukee, and Racine, Wisconsin, raided head shops that sell the substances. Police in Twin Falls, Idaho, raided an auto sales lot, a skate shop, and a tattoo and body piercing shop that were alleged to sell K2 and Spice. According to DEA Administrator Michelle Lenhart, agents in 31 states seized nearly 5 million packets of synthetic marijuana, material to make almost 14 million more packages at 29 manufacturing locations, and 167,000 packages of synthetic hallucinogens known as bath salts. The DEA and other law enforcement agencies also seized materials to make 392,000 more packets of bath salts. 
Well, there you go. The the, the big operation logjam. I love when they have the operational names here for them, as if they're you know some sort of military operation. Good to know that we're conducting operations against our own citizenry. That kind of always scares me. That kind of framing. Uh, but again, the whole K2 spice craze. Why does it exist? Because people like getting high. People like marijuana. They like the pleasant euphoria they get from it. They like the lack of side effects. They like the short duration. Everything about it is pleasant to the people who like to use marijuana. And when they get drug tested, when their jobs, their homes, their families, their careers, their lives are on the line over the, the results of a pee test, but they still want to be able to relax with their favorite uh, brand of euphoria, they turn to these synthetic things like K2 and Spice, trying to avoid the drug test, trying to avoid the black market, trying to avoid getting busted and ruining their lives. So once again, we find how marijuana prohibition has incentivized people to more dangerous substances. It has created and propped up and created a price support for the manufacturers and sellers of these more dangerous substances. You try to eliminate what you consider to be a problem with marijuana, you just create yourself a bigger problem with prohibition. Olympic drug testing means USA basketball players avoid being high scorer. According to former U.S. Olympian Grant Hill, recently interviewed on The Dan Patrick Show, he claims that nobody on the USA basketball team wanted to be the high scorer in any of their games because they would then be subject to a drug test. This from Grant Hill, quote, it was actually pretty funny. Nobody on the team wanted to be the leading scorer in those games, in the Olympic games, because whoever was the leading scorer ended up having to be drug tested. And the reason for that is the drug testing process, you'd, you'd be there for two hours after the game. And so nobody wanted to be there and have to go through that whole process. So if you watch those games and you watch the highlights at the end of the games, everyone is being super unselfish passing the ball, because no one wants to shoot. Leaving aside the obvious high scorer puns, does this bother anyone that the imposition of drug testing, meant to ensure the players are clean and achieving their greatest potential naturally, causes the best players instead to shave points from their greatest potential to avoid an annoying drug test? <laughs> I, yeah, I, I had to laugh when I saw the story, of course, with the, with the Olympics coming up. And you think of those dream teams of the 90s, you know, com consisting of the NBA players where they're winning their games by, what, like an average of 58 points per game. It was just it was like watching the Globetrotters and the Washington Generals. If you watched any of those Olympic games when they're beaten up on, you know, Angola, for God's sake. Uh, but, yeah, I, I guess this is about the only way you could get people like Michael Jordan or Sir Charles or some of these basketball players to be unselfish passers of the ball and not trying to be the high scorer in the game. You got to threaten them. You got to threaten them with a two hour wait before they can go out to the nightclubs in Atlanta. <laughs> Tasmanian government is investigating industrial hemp from the Australian Broadcasting Corporation's rural division. This week, the potential for developing a commercial industrial hemp growing industry in Tasmania has been detailed at a state parliamentary inquiry. An unusual case was put by a small northern Tasmanian recycled plastics manufacturer that wants to use hemp in its products. Environex is a specialty plastics manufacturer with a strong research and product innovation profile. The international director from the company, Michael Turner, says industrial hemp can help provide new markets for the plastic products. All up, half a dozen submissions were heard yesterday by the House of Assembly Standing Committee on Environment Resources and Development inquiring into Tasmania's industrial hemp industry. The hearing was the second in the inquiry into the current state of Tasmania's hemp industry and opportunities or solutions required to encourage a viable industrial hemp industry and associated value adding. Chairman of the inquiry, MHA Brenton Best, says so far they've not received any submissions arguing against the industry. Well, there, there we go. Once again, another country, another one of the Western industrialized nations, all of which have industrial hemp production, except us here in the good old USA. Now, don't get me wrong, cannabis, marijuana that you might smoke to get high is still quite illegal in Tasmania as it is in Australia, China, Britain, Russia, most of the EU, France, Belgium, all these other places that grow industrial hemp still have illegal marijuana for drug purposes. 
and yet their police are somehow able to easily distinguish between the two crops and separate the criminal drug growers from the industrial hemp farmers. Only in America are our police so dim-witted that it is impossible to, for them to tell the difference between a tall, 18-foot, reedy, closely planted stalk and fiber plant from a short, fat, bushy, planted far apart, sticky, buddy, resinous marijuana drug plant. Only in America would our cops be that dumb that we can't take and make use of our own hemp heritage. It's 420 back in Idaho where Russ and Carrie were born. So we have to go uh, connect with our roots, you know what I mean? Please support these sponsors who support the Russ Belleville Show. Oh, have you ever met that funny reefer man? A reefer man. Have you ever met that funny reefer man? A reefer man. If he said he swam to China, he would send you South Carolina. Then you know you're talking to that reefer man. The law offices of Omar Figueroa would like to remind you to stand up for your rights. Please do not give up your precious liberties. There's nothing wrong with standing up for our constitutional rights, and in fact, it's the only way to honor the Constitution that recognizes our natural rights. Treat law enforcement with respect and respect the Constitution by standing up for your rights. If you are detained or arrested, stand up for your rights by repeating, I respectfully invoke all my legal and constitutional rights. I do not consent to any search and seizure. I want to remain silent, and I want to speak to my attorney, Omar Figueroa. Omar Figueroa has more than a decade of experience in federal and California courts and graduated from Yale University, Stanford Law School, and Trial Lawyers College. Please contact the law offices of Omar Figueroa at 415-489-0420 or 707-829-0215 or on the web at www.omarfigueroa.com. Don't touch that dial. We'll be right back after a word from these 420 friendly sponsors. Uh, wait a minute. This is internet radio. There are no dials here. Everyone knows music and marijuana go together. So let's wind up our 20 after break with the Russ Belleville Show's Daily Toker Tunes, the best in pod safe 420 music from around the web. Today is Groovin' Thursday, featuring rap, hip hop, soul, and funk music. You can get downloads and more information about all our Daily Toker Tunes by visiting music.radicalrust.com. Now, sit back and enjoy your Daily Toker Tunes. All right, everybody, welcome back. It's just about 24 after the hour. And, uh, you know, I met Daniel Day Zuko down in Atlanta, Georgia, when I was there for their uh, Capital Cannabis Rally that they had uh, last year, back in uh, November or December. I can't remember exactly when. Anyway, I've been in touch with Daniel Day Zuko for quite a bit now. I'll be sending emails back and forth. And he promised when he had a new artist that he wanted to uh, debut, he would get me a line and let me know this that it was available. And sure enough, just yesterday, you know, just in time, Time for Groovin' Thursday. I got a note telling me you've got this new guy, Wes Green, this producer that he wants to promote and uh, that he'd be great for our show. So I trust Daniel DeZuko's word on that. We're just going to go right to it. This is Wes Green with Get Fresh 3. Yeah. Mr. Green. We back. We back. Fresh. Mm. Wes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this feel like a hip-hop night Hit shot, make sure he got the show set tight Walk like a king, cause I'm his And my team too, wear Ray-Bans So my shine gon' leak through Who do it like this? Tell him fall back Miss a fresh phone call, better call back Shades late night, really need him too Can't take right, like, don't even see it too Seen her over at the bar, she had a grown walk Had a chat with her, gave her grown talk Once I had nice words, shot her came close Spoke a few more Overdose, Blu-ray clear Moving too, stage so close it's so cool, five that time, ten toes down, wait for the drop from the new sound. Boom. 
moon. I like when your earlobe shake. Speakers bust out. Earth core shake. Shorty gets low. Party get good. Work around town. Make you fresh in your hood. I like when it's cold outside. The man goes up. Cause your body he rides. And shorty at the bar. Not no more. Said this her jam. Better get to the floor. She moving back like your buddy. Suggest you and her friends meet so lovely. Results of the jam are fresh. You can thank me later. Yes. Yes. You right there. Moving too. Stay so close. This so cool. About that time. Ten toes down. Wait for the drop from the new sound. Bounce to the tempo, stepping lightly down your street. Yeah, I pop my melt in your ear from the heat coming off these beats. Your speakers rocking, everybody in the whole spot popping. Fresh style on the stage, and we like the spot. So DJ, please. Hi, this is Dan Michaels. If you're looking for professional voice talent for your commercial or podcast, I'm your man. Visit danmichaelsaudio.com for more information. Same position this week I had last week when you asked the question, and that is I would not legalize marijuana for medicinal purposes, and the reasons are straightforward. As I talk to people in my state and at the federal government level about marijuana and its role in society, they are convinced that the entryway into a drug culture for our young people is marijuana. That marijuana is the, the starter drug, and that, and that the, the idea of medical marijuana is designed to help get marijuana out in the public marketplace and ultimately the, lead to legalization of, mar of marijuana overall. And in my view, that's the wrong way to go. And I know other people have differing views. And if you'd like to get somebody who's in favor of marijuana, I know there are some on the Democratic side of the aisle that will be happy to, to get in your campaign. But I'm opposed to it. And if you elect me president, you're not going to see legalized marijuana. I'm going to fight it to them. Here are some of the things you may hear on the Libra Lounge. And now the news. Bitches got something to say. If Obama wants to be Roosevelt, he has to end prohibition. You heard it here on the Libra Lounge. To visit here Wednesday nights at 6 Pacific. Or visit thelibralounge.com for archives and links to download current episodes. Be a lounger. Be a the war on drugs has been an utter failure, uh, and I think that we need to rethink and decriminalize uh, our, uh, our marijuana laws. And I'm not somebody, uh, but I'm not somebody who believes in uh, legalization of marijuana. I, what I'm not going to be doing, uh, what I'm not going to be doing, is using Justice Department resources. Uh, to try to circumvent uh, state laws on this issue, simply because I want folks to be investigating violent crimes and potential terrorism. Um, I, will, I will tell you that, you know, I mean, I want to be honest with you, whether I want to use a whole lot of political capital on that issue <laughs> when we're trying to get health care passed or end the war in Iraq uh, is... Uh, yeah, the likelihood of that being real high on my on my list is is uh, is not likely. Well, I think this is a, uh, a entirely legitimate topic uh, for debate. Uh, I am not in favor of legalization. Uh, I am a strong believer that we have to 
think more about uh, drugs as a public health problem. I have to say that there, there was one question that was voted on that, that ranked fairly high, uh, and that was whether legalizing marijuana would improve uh, the economy and job creation. And uh, uh, I don't know what this says about the online audience, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I, I just want, uh, I don't want people to think that uh, this was a fairly popular question. We want to make sure that it was answered. Uh, the answer is no, I don't think that is a good strategy to grow our economy. Look, I, you know, I, uh, when I was a kid, I, I, uh, uh, I inhaled uh, frequently. <laughs> That was, uh, that was, that was. The cannabis community includes a diverse set of activists and nonprofits working to end the prohibition of marijuana. We take the time to hear the stories of reform on the Russ Belleville Show's Cannabis Community Chat. All right, welcome back, everybody. 31 after the hour, we're waiting for our call from uh, Dr. Mark Kleiman, PhD. He's one of the co-authors of a new book entitled Marijuana Legalization, Everything You Need to Know. And uh, this is getting a lot of play on various websites, and I've uh, got a couple up here that have uh, made a point of it. On Huffington Post, the headline is, Pot Legalization Could Result in a Joint Costing a Few Cents. Uh, this also from Slate. Uh, they say it continues to be totally off the radar of prominent politicians, but polls indicate that large and growing numbers of Americans are open to the idea of legalizing marijuana. They point out the uh, 50% in the Gallup poll, the 56% in the Rasmussen poll. Now, the uh, this article claims that those polls are outliers, uh, meaning, you know, those are just exceptions, and most, you know, a lot of polls are still in the upper 40s on this issue, but uh, I wouldn't say that they're that much outliers, considering there have now been nine separate polls since, two, seven se separate polls since 2000. 2009 that have shown a majority support for marijuana legalization. Uh, the Rasmussen and Gallup polls that were already mentioned, but there are also uh, Angus Reid has produced three polls that have shown this, and there's been a couple of others that have shown above 50%. So uh, it's not so much of an outlier. They also point out that uh, the young voters are much more in support of legalization, and older voters are much more against it. So sooner or later, uh, we have to have an increase in support as those older voters are no longer with us. But according to this new book, uh, by Jonathan Calkins, Angela Hawken, Bo Kilmer, and our upcoming guest, Dr. Mark Kleiman, marijuana legalization, what everyone needs to know is that legal pot would be amazingly cheap. In fact, mid-grade stuff would be so cheap, this again according to Slate Magazine, mid-grade stuff would be so cheap that it might make sense for businesses to give it away like ketchup packets or bar nuts. Conventional thinking about pot pricing is often dominated by people's experience buying weed in legal or quasi-legal settings, such as Dutch coffee shops or California medical marijuana dispensaries. But this is badly misleading. Neither California nor the Netherlands permit growing or wholesale distribution of marijuana as a legal matter. If pot were fully legal, its growth, distribution, and marketing would work entirely differently. Another headline on this book that's very interesting uh, comes from uh, Rolling Stone magazine posted today, uh, Pot Legalization is Coming. Uh, they are pointing out here that uh, in November, voters in three states could approve ballot measures to legalize marijuana, and not just for medicinal purposes, for getting high purposes. Uh, they point out that uh, about half of America would be fine with that. Again, the support for marijuana legalization uh, is improving by uh, adults, and it is a relatively benign drug compared to uh, alcohol and tobacco. It's done an impressive job of racking up racially biased arrests, throwing people in jail, burning up police time, and propping up a $30 billion illegal market, enriching psychotic personal zoo-owning Mexican drug lords. But it hasn't stopped Americans from smoking a ton of weed. We're up to 20 to 30 million users, 3,000 tons, 6 billion joints a year, and rising. And teenagers, who ideally shouldn't be toking up on a regular basis, say pot is easier to get than beer. Quote, there's that Talmudic principle that a law that that's not obeyed is a bad law, says Dr. Mark Kleiman, a drug policy expert at UCLA and the co-author of the new book, Marijuana Legalization, What Everyone Needs to Know. He continues by saying, quote, I think we're pretty much at that point, end quote. So we're looking forward to the call in from uh, Dr. Is Dr. Kleiman on the line. All right, let's go to the phone lines here. Dr. Mark Kleiman, PhD from UCLA. Welcome to the Russ Belville Show. 
Thanks very much. I, I, it's a pleasure. You know, I'm really interested in talking to you about this issue because, of course, you're speaking to a, a very pro-marijuana legalization audience. And so when we hear things like mid-grade marijuana would be so cheap, it'd be given away like bar nuts, that actually sounds like a really good thing to us. Explain this economics. <laughs> Explain this economics as to why uh, uh, the marijuana would be so cheap under legalization. Well, it's a distinction here. There's legalization at the state level, as Colorado and Oregon and Washington are now considering for the fall. And there's legalization at the national level. Um, compared to the current fully illegal situation, legalization at the state level would cut the price of marijuana by about 90 percent, a little less. Uh, Rand estimates that a uh, uh, ounce of marijuana that sells for $300 in a California dispensary would go for about 50 bucks in a fully legalized retail state because the production would still have to dodge federal enforcement so you couldn't like have a farm, a farm field of it or a greenhouse full of it Sure, but you could rent a house and grow it inside the house and that's probably not enough activity for the DEA to pay much attention to and it would be legal under state law and doing the calculation about you know how much you have to rent the house for and how much you have to pay for the grow, grow lux bulbs and the cultivators and so on. Uh, Rand has estimated that the full retail price would be forty to fifty dollars an ounce. And we hear from plus whatever the state tax would be. Right, and then and then we hear from people that say, of course, with that uh, dramatic decrease in price in these western states, that would also lead to a price decrease uh, across the nation. But uh, wouldn't uh, the the illegal buyers and sellers still be forced to deal with their uh, prohibition risk at the state and federal level? I mean, would the prices sure really come down that much? Sure, they would. But 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 so if you're a if you're a, a drug dealer in New York, marijuana dealer in New York, you're currently paying about $2,000 a pound for top grade marijuana in California. Or you're paying somewhat less than that for much less good marijuana, uh, you know, the, just this side of the Mexican border. Right? Those are really your two options. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna leave out Canada for the moment. So you can pay 2,000 bucks a pound, that's uh, call it 150 bucks a, an ounce um, for sense of me in California or somewhat less than that for commercial grade in, uh, from Mexico. Uh, instead, you could just, you know, get some kids in Colorado each to go to 10 uh, marijuana retailers and buy, a, you know, the, the one ounce limit from each of those retailers. So if you've got 10 Smurfs, you've now got 100 ounces of marijuana um, that cost you 5,000 um, bucks. That's a lot cheaper and you can get it in California. And then you just have to either drive it home or FedEx it home. And, and certainly um, a lower risk for that person in New York. Much lower risk for that person in New York than buying from a strictly illegal dealer. Hmm. So the price in New York would go down as a result of legalization in Colorado. Uh, um, but that's just the state level thing. Now, the, the, beer, nuts, the beer nuts level is something else. <laughs> if the federal government legalized marijuana, um, so you could grow it the way you grow corn, you know, in big fields with combines to harvest it and mechanical um, processing. Then we're looking at another factor of 10 decrease in the cost of production. I mean, look, marijuana is a weed. Mm -hmm. It's really not very hard to grow. Um, and, uh, you know, it would cost what tea costs. And what does a tea bag cost? A couple of cents. Yeah. No reason a joint should cost more than that produced fully legally. Now, you could raise the price with taxes, but how much could you raise it before people started evading the taxes? That's what we're seeing with cigarettes. Sure. Now you said, that sounds like a really good thing. I want to suggest it doesn't sound like a really good thing. It reminds me of an old ad for some brand of premium scotch I saw in New Yorker a million years ago. It said, you know, if the difference in price between, I don't know, Shittis Regal or Johnny Walker Black or whoever it was, and ordinary scotch, matters to you. You're drinking too much. If paying what's a joint cost these days of good, good quality pot, maybe seven, ten bucks. Four dollars? <laughs> sure. Yeah, all right. And it'll keep two people stoned for four hours? Roughly. 
so they're paying 50 cents an hour to get stoned. So the candy bar they eat because they got the munchies costs more than the bot did. <laughs> if the price of the pot matters, you're smoking too much pot. Well, I, I guess I guess we have to define what smoking too much pot really means. I mean, uh, I I smoke pot every day, uh, probably more than 90, 95% of the people that use marijuana, uh, but I'm very productive. I don't get into trouble. Uh -huh. I mean, uh, what, is, I what is the danger we're worried about here if there's an increase in use or a decrease in price? Um, the danger we're worried about is that some people, and not a trivial number of people, who smoke the amount you smoke or more, um, actually find that it interferes with their lives. Right. So if you look at the household survey, you get about, you know, projecting to the population, you got two million people saying that their marijuana smoking is seriously interfering with their lives. Now, that's not nearly as many as would say that for alcohol, because alcohol is legal. It's not a small number. And one of the things that keeps people from smoking a lot of pot is it costs money. Uh, any commodity I know, if the price goes down, consumption goes up. And my argument would be, look, people who are smoking a reasonable amount of pot aren't paying that much for it. It's not a real big factor in their budgets. Hmm. Um, the guys who are, you know, wake and bake, you know, smoking eight joints a day, it's a big factor in their budget. Well, good. So then the, the effect of this then is, is we keep marijuana illegal, we arrest a bunch of people for it, and that maintains an artificial price support that prevents people from overdoing it. But doesn't that artificial price support also enrich murderous Mexican cartels? absolutely does that that's the problem of marijuana policy you've got a trade-off between illegality with all the costs of illegality and free availability with all the costs of increased drug abuse you got to try and figure out where on that spectrum you want to lie my view is we'd be better off conceding that some people are going to smoke too much pot making it legal trying to make it as expensive as we can under legality uh, and trying to limit the marketing Right, so my, my ideal system would be that people would join co-ops the way they do in Spain. Um, that there would not be big marijuana companies, you know, running Bud versus Bud Light ads on the Super Bowl. But I don't think we we've, we've got any idea what you know a real free market business could do with a fun drug like marijuana. They got well they've done with beer. True, but uh, and remember the the people in that business would not be at all interested in people who like to get stoned on Saturday night. No, I, they're not using enough pot to matter because they're not using enough pot to matter. Right, right. This is the same alcohol argument that's made that the the alcohol exactly. companies want the serious drinker, the casual drinker doesn't really do. matter to their business. But in that situation, we're talking about something that's toxic to healthy cells and organs and kills people that don't drink, whereas marijuana doesn't even kill the people that do smoke. It seems to be well, even if we did have companies that were advertising and making a lot of money by selling marijuana, so what? McDonald's makes a lot of money selling Big Macs. No, no, I look, I agree, of the currently illicit drugs, cannabis is the most legalizable. You know, in the sense that the health damage is limited and the personal damage is limited, not zero. You know, this nobody ever died is sort of silly by those standards. Nobody ever died of smoking tobacco either. No, no, nobody ever died of smoking tobacco? Well, if, if the rule is you're looking only at fatal overdoses, okay. cannabis smoking damages the lung. I can see there's not a fatal overdose for nicotine, but certainly it, it's the major contributor to, you know, lung cancer. Yes, and it looks like cannabis does not cause lung cancer, but it does cause other kinds of lung damage. It's very implausible that nobody dies. That it's very implausible that nobody ever died of an accident that happened because he was stoned. Because in the real world, people hurt themselves. Conceded. Oh. And so, so it's not zero. It's not very large. You know, the best argument for cannabis is that if there was more cannabis around, people would drink less. The problem is we don't know whether that argument is true or not. Because right? we know that, that alcohol and cocaine, for example, are complements. If there's more cocaine, people use more booze. If there's more booze, people use more cocaine. Yes, yes. We don't know whether they're making alcohol, marijuana legally available would lead to more or less heavy drinking. Haven't we seen some studies showing a decrease in alcohol consumption in the medical marijuana states, or at least beer consumption? 
uh, very un- I mean, there's, there's studies on both sides of that issue. And notice the medical marijuana states, marijuana costs what it costs in the black market states. Right. I mean, it's not cheap, right? We have not done the experiment with widely available, legal, cheap, heavily marketed pot. We just don't know what the consequences would be. Now, look, that not, that's not a good enough reason for saying, oh, let's be afraid to try it. Mm-hmm. But it's a good enough reason to say, look, let's not be too confident. I mean, now, look, I don't disagree with people who want to legalize cannabis. I disagree with the people who say, oh, let's legalize cannabis. Nothing bad will result. Ah, uh-huh. yes. Okay. Very impossible that nothing bad will result. We have to figure out what those bad things are, figure out whether we can come up with policies that will limit the extent of the bad things. Very, very reasonable. You know, Dr. Dr. Kleiman, I, I appreciate these viewpoints because uh, uh, oftentimes I find myself being the guy in my community saying, now hold on, it's not harmless. Anything that alters your perception isn't harmless. It's just a whole lot less harmful than a bunch of other things. Exactly. Oh, well, exactly. We're on the same page. Excellent. Well, you know, I look forward to you know talking to you more about this, and you know, with all the events that we do and and conferences and such, maybe we'll get a chance to meet in person sometime. I'd Do- be happy. Dr. Mark Kleiman is one of the co-authors of Marijuana Legalization: Everything You Need to Know, and a professor of public policy at the University of California, Los Angeles. And thanks for joining us here on the Russ Belville Show. I appreciate your expertise, sir. Thank you, Russ. All right. When we come back, we're going to be talking about another uh, drug policy expert, Dr. Kevin Sabet, who's got a recent op-ed in the Huffington Post saying that Californians have buyer's remorse over their medical marijuana program. I'm going to show you the evidence that that is absolutely not the case. The Russ Belldale Show. Stick around. We'll be right back after this. The Russ Belleville Show is blogging and podcasting daily at RadicalRuss.com. Are you or is someone you know a marijuana smoker? Have you or is someone in your family been arrested for a marijuana violation? You need to know the truth about pot. Normal, the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws, is the most comprehensive source of information regarding marijuana and its effects on health, as well as legal issues. Normal even offers a database of lawyers specializing in cannabis in your area. Normal, the nation's largest and most successful marijuana law reform organization, has spent decades gathering the knowledge and science on everything related to cannabis. Normal is the best resource to find out the truth about marijuana, connect with a lawyer in your area, or help find an end to prohibition. Information is available at normal.org, that's N-O-R-M-L dot org, or toll free at 888-67-NORMAL. The Russ Belleville Show. I'm not very good at uh, singing songs, but uh, here's here's a try. According to lifelong pot smoker and rocket scientist Carl Sagan, making apple pies from scratch is extremely difficult. If you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. Radical Russ and the Rolla J Studios crew will be right back after these messages. A morning filled with 400 billion suns. The rising of the Milky Way. The cosmos is full beyond measure. You want answers? I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. You want answers? You have offended my family. I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth. And you have offended a Shaolin Temple. You the truth. Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. <laughs> Welcome back, folks. 50 after the hour here. And, uh, well, my, my friend is at it again. Uh, Dr. Kevin Sabet. Uh, you know him. He's a 
He's out there in Florida. He works in drug policy, but his um, most uh, impressive piece of his resume is he was a uh, he worked at the Office of National Drug Control Policy for years. You know, the drug czar's office. And from 2009 through 2011, he was the right hand man to the drug czar. He was the major policy advisor, and his fingerprints are all over this new kinder, gentler drug war rhetoric that we're hearing. You know, that, that says that oh, we don't like the war on drugs metaphors, but doesn't actually change any of the tactics that they use or consider ending this war on drugs, right? We're just going to give it a new little shine, a new little polish there, right? Anyways, uh, uh, Dr. Sibet's got this new post up on Huffington Post, and the title of it is Medical Marijuana, Buyer's Remorse in California Reaches New Heights. Medical Marijuana, Buyer's Remorse in California Reaches New Heights. Now, unsurprisingly, Dr. Sibet has disabled the ability of Huffington Post readers to leave their own comments. It's not helpful to the mastermind of the kinder, gentler drug war to have average people poking holes in his illogic <laughs> or, you know, calling him out for wanting to put people in cages over their use of a substance that a DEA administrative law judge called the safest therapeutically active substance known to man over two dozen years ago. So we'll just take care of that right here, won't we? This is a let me quote Dr. Sibet here. This week, the Los Angeles City Council unanimously agreed to shut down all 900 storefronts selling marijuana for so-called medical purposes, scare quotes. Siding with neighborhood residents and public health experts like the American Medical Association, the council took a courageous stand against what has become a magnet for crime, nuisance, and addiction, end quote. First of all, Dr. Sabet always likes to put medical in scare quotes. You know, as if the federal government is sending a half pound of pre-rolled joints to four Americans every month just so they can better enjoy junk food and watching Harold and Kumar. Uh, the feds have been so busy patenting the medical uses of cannabinoids that uh, apparently they just didn't get around to it, right? Figuring out that they were sending medical marijuana to four Americans still. Uh, and yet... Dr. Sabet still uses this 1990s demonization of medical marijuana. You know, you know, something that three out of four Democrats and two out of three Republicans nationwide support. Yeah, that's right. Three quarters of Democrats, two thirds of Republicans nationwide support the medical use of marijuana. Now, as for that uh, American Medical Association, right, he mentioned that, you know, they were standing with the American Medical Association. He even provided a link to a paper by the American Medical Association. So I clicked the link and uh, maybe he missed this little part in the conclusions where the American Medical Association stated, quote, Results of short-term controlled trials indicate that smoked cannabis reduces neuropathic pain, improves appetite, and caloric intake, especially in patients with reduced muscle mass, and may relieve spasticity and pain in patients with multiple sclerosis, end quote. Hmm. That kind of sounds, um, I don't know, uh, medical! Kind of sounds medical to me, uh, Dr. Sabet. The American Medical Association said that. You know, they didn't say medical. Right. The American Medical Association didn't say may improve appetite, may relieve spasticity. No scare quotes. No, they're right on saying, yeah, yeah. And, and, and to be fair, to be fair in their position paper, the American Medical Association says, yeah, but, you know, smoking a joint isn't the way we should do it. We should work on better delivery methods. We should remove Schedule 1 restrictions so we can do research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I know. To be fair, they're not out there saying, yeah, smoking a doobie is the best thing to do for MS. But they are admitting smoked cannabis reduces pain, improves appetite, and may relieve spasticity. So there is no denying that smoked cannabis is medical. Might not be as medical as you like it. Might not be medical in the way that you like it delivered. Might be medical in a way that has side effects you don't prefer, but still medical. Let me continue with Dr. Sabet, who says, quote, the vote and the federal court ruling confirming the decision that followed just, af just hours after signals a major sense of buyer's remorse Californians are feeling after voting in medical marijuana 16 years ago. Okay, okay, so the votes of a city council that has always hated medical marijuana and the votes of four U.S. federal district court judges who maintain the Schedule One lie that there's no such thing as medical in marijuana 
That's supposed to indicate that a majority of 37 plus million Californians are feeling some sort of buyer's remorse, right? I have an idea. Let's ask the Californians. If only we had some sort of scientifically uh, reliable way to accurately sample a small representative portion of a population and gauge their reaction to certain questions in a way that might determine what the larger majority of them feel. Let me think. Oh, yeah. Polling. Polling. Oh, yeah. Let's take a look here. According to the most recent California field poll on the issue of medical marijuana dated September 2010, quote, Three in four of California's registered voters, or 74%, approve of the state's medical marijuana law, which was enacted by voters in the November 1996 election, end quote. Now, they also pointed out what the field poll numbers were for 2004, six years prior, and the level of support was 74%. So in 2004, there was 74% amongst all Californians for medical marijuana law. After six years of dispensaries popping up, more dispensaries than Starbucks, oh my God, the kids are going to be smoking pot, oh my God, oh my God. After six years of that, still 74%. <laughs> still 74% support. And the opposition dropped four points. That's right, more people moved into the don't know category from the no category on medical marijuana in six years. And at least three out of five Californians in any, any demographic you want to pick out of that poll, even elderly Republicans in the Central Valley who've never smoked pot in their life, support the medical use of marijuana. Now, that's 60 percent or greater support for medical marijuana in California amongst every religious age voting demographic there is, geographic, demographic, all of it. 60% or greater in every result. In your Democratic liberal youngers, they're like 80% results for support of California medical marijuana. Even though, quote, most voters, 57%, think the medical marijuana law has made it easier for people to obtain marijuana, even among those without a medical need, end quote. So every demographic group is at least 60% support for a medical marijuana law, even though almost 60% of the people think that medical marijuana is a little shady and a lot of people without a medical need are still getting it. And they still don't care. And they still support it with 74% statewide. Now, in another poll, this was taken in November of 2010. Uh, it's called an election. Uh, voters in Los Angeles County narrowly defeated the Prop 19 attempt to legalize marijuana for non-medical use by a vote of 52%. However, the statewide vote was 53.5%. So it seems like Los Angelinos are a little more accepting of marijuana use for non-medical purposes than Californians in general. Sebet continues, fast forward 16 years and most Californians know that medical marijuana has become a sad joke. Today's dispensaries, really pot shops selling the drug under the guise of medicine, bear little resemblance to voters' intent. And then, and then Dr. Sabet lists all these supposed problems with the Los Angeles medical marijuana dispensaries, such as, quote, the average Prop 215 cardholder being a 32-year-old white male smoking pot for relaxation instead of using other drugs and alcohol. California doesn't have cards either, Kevin, but, you know, why let accuracy intrude now? We're supposed to be shocked that not everyone using cannabis is a cancer patient on his deathbed. But as he notes, it's been 16 years. Surely everyone in California is well aware of this fact, at least 57% of them. <laughs> and yet that public support for the law remains at 74%. Continuing from Sabet. The city council should be recommended for taking a courageous stance against these storefronts and catching up with popular opinion. Well, the city council's clearly going against popular opinion. They're the ones for the situation that it, Dr. Sabet thinks is problematic. Nobody, not even us legalization advocates, supports anything goes marijuana storefronts and sales and ads to kids and public medication and shady gang-connected distribution any more than we'd want that for alcohol or tobacco. But for 16 years, the LA City Council has failed every opportunity to work with the medical marijuana advocates to craft workable dispensary regulations, such as the ones that seem to serve San Francisco and Oakland so well. Now, they just want to throw the baby out with the bathwater and ban all dispensaries. As if the hundreds of thousands of patients with marijuana recommendations are going to stop buying marijuana. They're just going to go buy it underground where no legit jobs are created and no tax revenues can be reaped by Los Angeles or California. 
Sabet also says there's a way to do medical marijuana right through science, pharmacies, and non-smoked medications based on the marijuana plant. But we cannot rely on marijuana advocates for that. So in closing, Dr. Sabet reveals the true cause of his willful distortions of California's support for medical marijuana. It's the federal government that steadfastly refuses to acknowledge that a raw, whole plant can be safely used without a single casualty in 5,000 years. This is the Russ Belleville Show. The Russ Belleville Show is blogging and podcasting daily at RadicalRuss.com. Yes, yeah, apparently, according to Dr. Sibet, marijuana can only be medical when it's done right through the pharmaceutical companies that make massive campaign contributions and scientific FDA approval processes that brought us Viox, Fenfen, and Baycol. Take care of each other, tokers.